So we're going to work through this uh, review sheet to get ready for this test coming up. Um, primarily, the sheet covers sections 12.3, 12.4, 12.7, and then that trig section 14.3. And then we've got some review. Um, you'll notice on the back, uh, we've gone back all the way to chapter four with some review questions. Just looking ahead to that big uh, end of course exam that we're gonna take uh, on May the 10th and 11th, and then you've got your semester exam after that. So I uh, just don't want you to forget a lot of this stuff. So I'm hoping that with the repetition, it'll help you in a few weeks. All right, so first of all, We've got this uh, triangle ABC that we need to draw for these first three problems. So uh, let's just sketch uh, triangle ABC. And we're told in the instructions that angle B is the right angle. So it really doesn't matter what we call these others. Okay, we're also told that side AB measures 30 units. So here's side AB, and we're told that secant A is the ratio 5 over 3. Okay, so here's angle A. If we look out from angle A, uh, somebody tell me what the secant uh, trig ratio is the inverse of. Yeah, cosine. Okay, so cosine A, in other words, let's just do this. Cosine A is the fraction 3 over 5. That's actually the answer to one of our questions. But to get the other sides of the triangle, let's think about this. For angle A, cosine, remember, means adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, it looks kind of funny because this says the adjacent side is 3. But hold on for a second. If uh, the hypotenuse is 50, 30 over 50 would reduce to 3 over 5. Okay, so now how do you think we're going to find this other leg BC? Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so the hypotenuse squared, 50 squared, is equal to, we'll just call this A squared plus B squared, which is, well, actually it's C squared, but you get the point. All right, so make sure you got your calculator handy. We need to do uh, 50 squared minus 30 squared. Yes. Okay, 1,600. That's A squared, but doing the square root of that would give us A, 40. Okay, so we've got all the sides of our triangle. This problem tends to confuse some people because they're looking at this reduced fraction and they're wondering where those numbers came from. So you just have to think that is reducing these sides. All right. So let's go ahead and answer uh, our questions here. We already know what cosine A is. We answered that right off the bat. That's three-fifths. Okay. Now let's answer sine A. How would you describe the sine ratio? How would you describe it? Okay, for angle A, the opposite side is 40. The hypotenuse, of course, is 50, but 40 over 50 reduces to 4 fifths. Okay, uh, describe for me, someone raise your hand and describe the tangent ratio. Yeah. Okay, and for angle C, for angle C, it's the opposite side, which is 30 divided by the adjacent side, which is 40. 30 over 40 reduces to 3 fourths. So those are your first three answers. Yeah? That's fine. Yeah, um, since you're not finding any angle measurements, if you were finding angle measurements here, you would need the exact side lengths, but that's okay. Good question. Anybody else? Everybody good on one, two, three? All right, uh, let's try these problems. So once again, uh, I always think it's helpful to sketch a right triangle, some, give you something to look at. Uh, DEF is our triangle and angle F is the right angle. 
So we'll just call this D, and this will be angle E. So remember, we talked about this after the quiz. Please remember to label your sides properly. If I'm calling this angle E, then this has to be side E, and that's going to be 6. Um, side F will actually be the hypotenuse. It's the side opposite the right angle. So let's take a moment with your calculator and find this missing side D. Okay, so once again, uh, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. If you don't label your sides correctly, some of you did this on the quiz, you're not going to know that maybe this is the hypotenuse. 10 squared is equal to, I'm just going to call this D squared plus 6 squared. Okay, so uh, do the subtraction, 10 squared minus 6 squared. And then the square root of that. So uh, tell me what you got for D. 8, all right. So we found side D. And I would appreciate it when you give me your answers. Make sure you label sides with lowercase letters and angles. You can use the symbol with a, an uppercase letter. OK? So we found uh, side D. Now let's work on uh, angle either D or E to start with. Really doesn't matter. Um, we know all three sides, so we got a lot of options. Uh, let's say that we're going to find this missing angle D by using sine. Okay, the sine ratio is opposite over hypotenuse. Okay, so I'm going to set it up as the sine of this angle D is equal to the opposite side, which is 8 over 10, but I'm going to go ahead and reduce that. 8 over 10 is really 4 fifths. All right, so keep this in mind. Whenever you're trying to find a missing angle, this is when you want to use inverse trig ratios. All right, so to find angle D, I'm actually going to do inverse sine on both sides. You only really need to show it on the side that has the fraction. But technically, we did it on both sides. So grab your calculator and uh, do second sign and then put four fifths in parentheses. And uh, that should be rounded to uh, 53.1 degrees. Okay, any questions on angle D? And now finding angle E is easy, just remembering that the sum of the three angles have to add up to 180. So we'll start with 180, we'll subtract 90, we'll subtract what we just found for angle D, and uh, since we rounded, we'll say this is approximately, angle E is approximately 36.9 degrees. Okay, any questions about number four? All right, let's go ahead and work on number five. Let's just draw another right triangle. Set it up the same way. F is the right angle. So we'll just go ahead and be consistent. We'll call those D and E. This time we're given side D, which is this bottom leg. It's measured at 12. So we're going to be looking for the hypotenuse and side E. We know angle E, this angle right here, is 50.2. Okay, so give me some ideas um, how to find one of these sides, either side E, which is over here, or the hypotenuse, which we'll just label as side F. Somebody uh, give me a suggestion on how to find either one of those sides. Any thoughts? Well, if you're looking out from angle E, which is where we should be looking because we've been given that measurement, uh, you could use the ratio of opposite over adjacent. That's tangent, OK? Um, let's just go ahead, for sake of time, let's just go ahead and go with that. Tangent. 
And then let's put in the measurement for angle E is 50.2 is equal to the opposite side, which is what we're looking for, divided by the adjacent side. And now finding side E will be pretty easy. We're going to multiply by 12 on both sides. So you literally enter this into your calculator. 12, 10, 50.2 is equal to E, and since we're rounding to the nearest tenth, hopefully you got 14.4, uh, okay? That takes care of side E. So uh, how are we gonna find side F, the hypotenuse? Pythagorean theorem, okay? I should have made this more plain to be a lowercase F. Okay, let's use the Pythagorean theorem. We're trying to find the hypotenuse, so I'm just going to leave it as f squared is equal to e squared plus d squared. All right, so add those together, those two numbers squared, and then find the square root of that, and we're going to round so according to my calculations, if you did this correctly, see if we match uh, rounded, that should be 18.7. You agree with that? Okay, that's side F. All right, the only thing we haven't found is this angle D up here on the top. So uh, how are we going to find that? If we know two angles, which we do, how can we find the third? Exactly. So we'll start with 180 and subtract our right angle, subtract the given angle. And that makes uh, angle D, I'll just put it up here, uh, angle D should be about, since we're rounding, 39.8 degrees. All right, any questions on those? So just a word of warning, uh, those are going to take you a few minutes. And if you're still struggling with the trig ratios, uh, you're still having to think, uh, you, you really need to drill those six trig ratios, the what we would call the three main ones, and then their inverses. Uh, so you can just jump right in and know which ratio to use for whatever it is you're asked to find. All right, let's do this uh, problem, this little word problem. And uh, let's just draw a picture of this. We have this ladder that is leaning against a house at the very top of a house. So uh, let's just say that this is the wall of the house. It's straight up and down. And uh, we'll do this as the ladder that is leaning against it, reaching the very top of the house. Okay, so we're assuming here that the house makes a right angle. It's a perfectly straight wall. Okay, terrible drawing, but you get the idea. So here's our ladder leaning against the house, and we're told that it's 25 feet in length. We're also told that the ladder where it meets the top of the house forms an angle of 41 and a half degrees. So this angle where the ladder is leaning against the house measures at 41 and a half. So our job here is to find this height. How tall is the house? Okay, so we're looking out from this angle that we're given, this 41 and a half. We know the hypotenuse. We don't know this side, which would be called the adjacent side. So give me a trig ratio that would involve those adjacent and hypotenuse. Yep, cosine. Okay, so let's think of cosine for this angle that we're given is 41 and a half. And then make the ratio for cosine. It's adjacent, which is what we're actually looking for, divided by hypotenuse, which we are given. And now finding our height it will be pretty easy. We're just going to multiply by 25 on both sides. So in your calculator, you can literally type this in. 25 cosine 41 and a half. 
and we're going to round that to the nearest tenth. And um, let's see if we match. That is 18.7 feet. Okay, so let me just give you a word of warning. Uh, these trig word problems, we'll call it, for a right triangle, um, I'm not going to say on the test you're going to be working from this angle. Uh, we had a quiz problem the other day where you were working from this angle. Remember that? Where uh, we were, we had an 11 degree angle from where the person looked up from the ground. So I don't want you just to think, hey, on the test, I'm going to have this angle measurement. You're going to have to decide based on the wording of the problem where to place this angle. Okay. Any questions about that? Questions? Okay. Uh, we may have time for just. Uh, let's go ahead and do this one, and this might wrap it up. Um, interesting, interesting question here. Uh, we have this triangle X, Y, Z, and we're told that Z is the right angle. We're also told that tangent X, and remember, Again, drill those ratios. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So for angle X, we know then the opposite side is 8. Opposite over adjacent for angle X. The opposite side will be 8. The adjacent side for angle X will be 15. The question is, what is sine y? Well, here we are looking out from angle y. Sine ratio is opposite over hypotenuse. To answer this question, we're going to have to figure out what the hypotenuse is. Okay, Easy enough. That's the Pythagorean theorem. z squared, that's side z, so I'll just leave it as z squared, is equal to x squared plus y squared. Okay, Grab your calculator. Uh, if I remember correctly, this ends up being 389, 289, thank you. And then the, that does have a perfect square root, uh, it should be 17. Okay, now it makes it pretty easy to answer this question. Looking out from angle Y, let's make the ratio of sine uh, opposite over hypotenuse, so the answer will be 15 seventeenths. Okay, any questions on that problem? Okay, uh, moving on to problem number eight. Uh, this is one of our stats problems, and uh, I've given you a list of values there for you, and uh, the directions are on number eight. Uh, we are to find the mean, median, and uh, could be more than one mode, so... Um, We'll check that out, and then if we do need to do any rounding, we're going to round to the hundredths, two decimal places. So first of all, uh, we'll zip through this one pretty fast. I think this uh, most people understand this pretty well. To find the mean, uh, we need to add these numbers up. So uh, take care of adding up all your numbers. And uh, you can check out my sum. Uh, I came up <clears throat> with a sum of 619. Does that match you guys? The sum of the set of numbers is 619. And then, of course, to find the average, we divide that number by the number of terms in our data set. And I counted 13. So uh, when we do 619 divided by 13, that gives us a mean, since we're rounding, we'll say approximately 47.62. <clears throat> okay. So the median, of course, that means the middle number. Maybe um, years ago you learned to find the median like this. Uh, if you want to find the one in the middle, you just start marking off. Have you all seen this before? You mark off from the ends and then work your way toward the middle. Uh, maybe you don't have to do this, but for some people it's kind of helpful. I'm marking them off two at a time. 
And since I have an odd number of numbers, this is one of those cases when we have an odd number, we can actually see the median. We don't have to figure it. So the median's pretty easy. That should be 48. And we'll also, since we've got to do the box and whisker plot eventually, we'll go ahead and label that <clears throat> as Q2. <clears throat> All right. And then, uh, what does mode refer to? Somebody raise your hand and tell me what are we talking about when we are looking for the mode uh, channeler? What are we what are we referring to? Okay, the most frequently occurring, and uh, what would you say there, Chandler? Okay, so in this case, uh, this is actually considered to be bimodal. We actually have two numbers that both occur twice, so we would say that there's actually modes, plural, 41 and 49. Okay, now let's uh, do our box and whisker plot from this data. Well, remember that to do a box and whisker plot, we need not only Q2, but we got to find Q1 and Q3. So just think about it like this. Q2 basically divides your data up. Just think of a dividing line that splits your data up into two groups. Two groups, in this case, of six. I got six numbers on the left of my dividing line, and then I've got another six on the right. Okay, I got an even number of numbers in each group. So now let's find the median of this left group. So Kaylee, uh, what would the median be for this left group of six? Okay, and we would call that what? How would we label that? This is Q2 in the middle, so this is Q1. Okay, so Molly, what is my Q3? 51, that's the median of this right group of six. So basically the box and whisker plot, it's also known as the five number summary. And the reason for that is it's going to picture, basically it's going to highlight five numbers. The very lowest number, the very highest number, and each of these quartiles, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So I went ahead and just sketched a number line in intervals of two. And so now let's plot these numbers, these five numbers on the number line. So I'm going to call 41 about right there. Okay, Q1 is 44 and a half, so it's just a little bit to the right of 44. Q2 is 48, making a dot above 48. Uh, Q3 we said is 51, we'll put that right there. And then the very highest number in the set is 54. All right, so for the quartiles, I'm going to draw lines through those, vertical lines. And then I'm going to enclose those vertical lines with a box. Okay, so that's the box part of this little graph. And now we're going to do these whiskers, which are extensions from the box out to the lowest number there and the highest number there. And there is your box and whisker plot for that data. Okay, any questions about number nine? All right, uh, let's move on. Um, we basically can, uh, we know what interquartile range is. We can figure that pretty easily. Uh, how do I determine the range, um, Jackson? Uh, you mean 54? <clears throat> okay, so you take the highest number, Subtract from it the lowest number, and we should get a range of 13. Okay. Now, how do I determine interquartile range? Uh, Nicholas, how is that figured? Okay, very good. We take Q3 and we subtract from it Q1. And let me look back. We said that Q3 is 51. 
Q1 was 44 and a half. You do the little subtraction there, and you should get an interquartile range of six and a half. So those are answers for, this is basically your answer for number 10, and this is number 11. Okay, any questions on those? Everybody good so far? All right. Uh, let's do the standard deviation problem. And on your test, I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers. I think it's also five. So um, I know if you have a lot of numbers to do with, these can take a little longer. But the first thing I'm going to do is set up this little table. Uh, I'm going to just call this first column um, the given numbers. I'm just calling it X. So I'm just going to list my numbers that were given in the problem. And these do not have to be in order. Order really doesn't matter. Make sure you have your calculator ready because uh, you need to work through this and make sure you understand this little process. Okay, well, the problem says to find the mean and the standard deviation. Well, it, you can't find the standard deviation without knowing the mean. So let's do that first. Uh, let's find the mean of this data set. <clears throat> Give you a second to do that. Uh, maybe Jordan, can you have you found the mean yet? 50. All right. So I'm going to do this just to save a little bit of time. Uh, I'm not going to write 50 every single time, but I'm just going to show that it fills the whole column. And now my next column will be these numbers subtracted. So we'll call this x minus x bar. All right, so uh, grab your calculator, and then I'm going to have some people just give me these numbers. <clears throat> so, Daniel, what's the second number in this list? 53.2 minus 50. Okay. 52.3 minus 50, Ethan Hill. 52.3 minus 50, the next one, it's 2.3, okay, uh, Noah, 46.6 .6 minus 50, okay, and 49.9 minus 50, Rachel, all right. Now my next column will be these numbers squared. So take a moment and raise each of those to the second power. And be careful. Remember, no negative numbers in this column. It's a common mistake people make. When you square a negative number, it has to become positive. So Brooke, what do you got for a 3.2 squared? Nine point four four, ten point twenty four. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Lily, what about two point three squared? Five point two nine. Chase, negative three point four squared. And Reagan, negative point one squared. Okay, now this is the only one of these columns that <clears throat> we need to come up with a sum for. So we need to add these numbers up. And Parker, let me know when you get those added up. Thirty-one point one. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Now we're ready to move right into the standard deviation formula. Okay. Here's the symbol for standard deviation, and here's how you find it. It's the square root of that sum. I'm just going to write it out, and then we'll fill in. All right. We just did that symbol means the sum of this column, and we just found that. 
And then that number will be divided by the number of terms. And there are five terms. Okay? So um, in your calculator, you're going to be doing the square root of 31.1 divided by 5. And make sure you're doing the square root of the entire fraction. And uh, we're going to round this. The directions tell us to round to the nearest tenth, one decimal place. So, Cody, uh, tell us what you got. 2.5. So, how many of you got 2.5? Okay. So, now you know how to do standard deviation, how to come up with the numbers that go in the formula, and make sure you know the formula uh, for the test. Any questions on number 12? <clears throat> All right. Let's uh, take a look at, all right, um, given a set of data, we're supposed to find the 20th and the 80th percentiles. Uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I, I made this because time is of the essence for the test, and there's a lot to do on this test. Um, you notice that these numbers are not in order. Well, before you can find percentiles, they've got to be in lowest to highest order, okay? Okay. So um, give you just a second to get ahead of me, and then I'll have you call out some numbers. Now, on the test, I, I made it a little bit easier. I went ahead and put them in order for you. But I did, I did want you to remember, realize that you have to rank these. To find percentiles, uh, you'll have to rank them if they're not already. So Ethan Carter, what's our first number? 168. OK. Uh, next number, Preston, 170, okay, next Sierra, 172, okay, uh, let's see, Jordan, what's the next one, 174, and uh, we don't have another one of those. Looks like 176 twice. Be careful because it uh, looks like there's two of those. And then 178. Uh, 180. 182. 184. 186 twice. Uh, 188. 190. And uh, last one should be 198. So let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 numbers. Okay, so here's how I find the number that's sitting at the 20th percentile. I take the number of numbers, 15, and I multiply by 20% as a decimal, and I get 3. So the number that's the, 30, uh, the 20th percentile is the number that is sitting better than, the first number that I come to that's better than the first 3 in the ranking, and that would be 174. So we'll label this as the 20th percentile. OK, to find the number that's at the 80th percentile, we're going to do the same thing, except this time we're going to multiply by 80%. And uh, what is, Daniel, 15 times 80%? 12. So I'm looking basically for the 13th number in the list. So 15th, 14th. 13th should be better than the previous 12. So this number, 188, is the one that's at the 80th percentile. All right, any questions on percentiles? Pretty easy. All right, moving right along. We have this set of data that has a z-score of 4 a value of 55, a mean of 35, and we're asked to find the standard deviation. Well, to find this, to get this answer, you're going to have to remember the z-score formula. It's been a few days since we've looked at this. Z-score is found by doing this little math, value, or number in our data set, 
minus mean divided by standard deviation. So we're given all parts of this little formula except for standard deviation. We're going to have to solve for that. So z-score is 4. The value is given as 55. The mean is given as 35. And we're supposed to solve, we'll just call this x. We're finding this denominator. Okay, pretty easy though. If I multiply by x, I get 4x equals 20. 55 minus 35 is 20. So my answer, the standard deviation is 5. So you're going to need to know this little uh, z-score formula. And let me give you a heads up. In this problem, I'm asking you to find standard deviation. I might give you everything except for the mean and ask you to tell me what the mean is. But it's the same process. You just solve for whatever is missing. Okay. I will have to give you of these four parts, I'm going to have to give you three of them and you find the one that's missing. Yeah. You may not write the formula as standard deviation is value minus mean over z-score. Uh, if I give you this, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right. You guys are doing great. Uh, we're almost done. Um, this is based on last night's homework. So this is going to be a review of that standard normal curve. So to help out with answering 16, 17, and 18, I'm going to do a standard normal curve based on what I'm told in this problem. At least I'm going to do the x-axis and then the intervals. All right, so we're told that the mean, that's where we start building this x-axis. We start in the middle with the mean, and we're told that that's 72. And these are all years of athletes. Standard deviation of 10 means that I'm going to build the rest of this by adding 10, going to the right. 102-year-old runner, that would be pretty old. Did y'all see where the oldest living person died recently? And they were how old? 117. Yeah, I think they, in Italy, I can't remember where, but 117. She was in pretty good health from what I understand. It just depends. Okay, so do you see how I got this x-axis? Starting with the mean and then building plus 10 to the right, minus 10 to the left. And now, very important, remember those percentages. Within one standard deviation of the mean, this should capture a total of 68%, but it's 34% on either side. Okay, then when we go out two standard deviations from the mean, We'll have 13.5% in each of these areas. And then our other 5% are in split up with 2.5% here, 2.5% here. here. So you don't have to really do anything fancy. Just give yourself something to look at. And now use this one sort of standard normal curve to answer the question. So we want to know there's 400 athletes in this run. We want to know what percentage of them, according to this normal distribution, fall between 72 and 82. Well, that should be 34% of our runners. And how many runners are there? 400. Okay. So to get the answer for number 16, I'm going to take the total number of runners and multiply by 34%. Point 0.34. And uh, let's see, Preston, what do you got for that? 400 times 34%. 136 runners 
in this particular race are between 72 and 82 years old. Okay, let's move on to the next question. How many of these runners, how many of these 400 runners are less than 72 years old? Okay, well here's 72, so we basically need to add up all the percentages to the left of 72, which should be 50%. So we're going to start with our 400 runners. Obviously, if we multiply by 50%, that's half. So 200 of our runners in this particular race are less than 72 years old. And then one more. Um, how many of these 400 runners fall between 62? I'll change the colors here. They fall between 62 and 92. Well, add up all those percentages, 34, 34, and 13 and a half. So you're basically adding up all of these in this range. That should be 81 and a half. And again, we have 400 runners. You multiply that by 81 and a half. And uh, let's see, Molly, what'd you get for that? Okay, so 326 of our runners are in this age group. Okay, and that's your three answers, all of them standard normal curve answers. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, this is a way back problem. Remember these? You got one of these on your uh, end of course exam. Your end of course exam is going to take two days. It's on May the 10th and the 11th. And uh, I just don't want you to forget some stuff. That's an important exam for the math department because it tells us what you're ready for next. Um, are you ready for pre-cal? Do you need some remediation before you get to pre-cal? It's, it's really good for us to um, analyze that those numbers. Plus, I'll probably give you a quiz grade for it. All right, so uh, solve for this matrix by using an inverse matrix. So to find an inverse matrix, we first have to find the determinant. So we need to find the determinant of this matrix that's being multiplied on the left side. All right, so uh, in case you forgot, let me just label these elements. To find the determinant, you basically do this. I'm going to use variables, and then I'm going to go back and put in actual numbers. You multiply the A and the D, and then you subtract the product of the B and the C elements. Okay, so for this matrix, 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. Minus, and then when you multiply these together, you get negative 12. So the determinant is 2. Okay, well here is the formula for finding the inverse, and then we'll put some actual numbers in it. 1 over the determinant, and once we get that fraction, we will be multiplying by this. Um, the A and the D elements of this will switch places. The B and the C elements will change signs. I'm just going to indicate it like this. So this is what you use as a template to find the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. So here it is for this problem. 1 over the determinant, 1 over 2, times, all right, let me get a helper. Uh, what's going to go here? Um, Rachel, negative 2. Reagan, what's going to go here? Positive 3. Very good. Uh, Jared, what's going to go down here in bottom left? Negative 4. Good. And Lucas, what about here? Awesome. Now what do I do? Uh, let's see. Ethan Hill, what's next? Exactly. Everything gets multiplied by one half. All right. So what's one half times negative two? Negative one. All right. Uh, Lily, one half times three. Three halves. Uh, Sierra, one half times negative four. Okay. 
And uh, let's see, Kaylee, one half times five. Okay, now what do we do with this? This is our official inverse. What do we do with it to get our answer? You might know. Yeah. And do what with it? Okay, and you do what with it? You multiply them together, okay? So we're going to multiply this inverse times the matrix on the right. So does it matter, Daniel just ex described it uh, really well, does it matter in which order these go? Exactly does. The inverse has to go to the left, okay? So let's multiply these together. Uh, Preston, I'm going to get you. Do you remember how to, using row times column, can you tell me what goes up here? Negative 1 times 5 plus 3 halves times 10. Okay. So you see how negative 1 times 5 is negative 5, 3 halves times 10 is 15. You add those together, and he's exactly right. You get 10. Uh, Jackson, help me out with the bottom number, negative 2 times 5, okay, plus 5 halves times 10, 25. And you put those together, and you get 15. So there's our final answer to this problem. Yes? Yeah, you do. You add the products together. Yes, good question. Anyone else have a question? Question? Okay. All right, we're ready to move on to number 20. Uh, we're in the review section of this uh, review sheet. I've gone back to chapter, I pulled a problem out of chapter four, one out of chapter five. Uh, I think I got one out of chapter six. Uh, a lot of good stuff going way back. Uh, don't want you to forget it because, well, there's two reasons. On May the 10th and 11th, you're going to take on Moodle what is known as the end of course exam, EOC. Uh, you will probably get a quiz grade for it, but more importantly, it's good information for us as a math department to know what you're ready for next and what you might need to do to get ready for what is coming next. Okay, we want to know where you stand from an algebra standpoint, and this exam, it's 40 problems, mostly multiple choice, uh, is going to give us a really good picture of where you are. Um, so anyway, that'll be May 10 and 11, uh, just so you know. But that's the reason why a lot of these uh, problems are being recycled, because I don't want you to forget it. I want you to do well, not only on the semester exam, but on the end of course exam. All right, so this is one of those uh, parabola problems where we're asked to find the highest point or the maximum. So in other words, uh, just think of it this way. If this is a parabola that opens down, which is indicated because not only is it squared, which indicates parabola, but it's got a negative sign, which means it opens down. So basically, we're asked to find the highest point. We're asked to find the vertex of this parabola. Okay. So in case you forgot, the way we find the vertex is we first find the AOS by doing the opposite of B over 2A. Connecting this little formula to this problem, uh, what we will actually be finding in this particular problem when we do this, we will be finding T. And what does T stand for? It stands for how long it will take in seconds for this projectile to reach its highest point. All right, so we just plug in. The opposite of B, which is 64, over 2 times A, which is negative 16. So we get the opposite of 
64 over negative 32 is negative 2. The opposite of negative 2, of course, is positive 2. And putting it in context, we would say that it's going to take, we just answered this, basically this sentence, how long is it going to take for this projectile to reach its highest point? It will take two seconds. So let me caution you, if you end up, like some people do, using this formula and you end up with a negative answer, something should sound off in your brain that time is negative. Is that even possible? And the answer is no. So if you end up with a negative, you know you've not included the opposite of b over 2a, or you put in positive 16 for a instead of negative, whatever the case is. So we've answered this first sentence, and now uh, we're going to answer how high will it go. Well, that's what h stands for. It's height. So if we know what t is, finding the height is really pretty easy. We just substitute 2 in for t. And if you don't have your calculator out, you can go ahead and grab it. Okay, uh, let me get uh, Connor. Do you have that number for H? 64? Okay. And uh, putting it in context of the problem, uh, it will go a total height of 64 feet in two seconds. So in other words, we just found the vertex of this parabola. You don't, don't have to write this, but I just want you to know. The vertex of this parabola would be 2... 64. Okay, this is a pretty useful formula uh, when dealing with finding either the lowest point or the highest point of a parabola, and you're going to see that again in the near future. So I just wanted to refresh your memory a little bit. All right, let's take a look at this. This goes back to chapter six. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Very good. Um, you might not remember back in section 6.8, I know you've probably forgotten a lot of stuff, but back in this section we learned about the binomial theorem and we learned how to use the binomial theorem to solve certain types of probability problems where there are two possible outcomes and we called those success or failure. Well, we don't necessarily have success and failure here, but we have two possible outcomes. Either a student is going to buy a class ring or they're not. That's what it amounts to. So let's write down the likelihood percentage-wise that a student is going to buy a class ring. And that's a 30% likelihood according to the problem. So I'm just going to label this as buy, which means the likelihood that they will not buy. I need to calculate pretty easily. There's a 70% chance that a student will not buy. Okay, so that's a good starting point. These two percentages, I've got them as decimals, but they should be percentages that add up to 100%. There's only two possibilities. Now, the question as we read on, we're going to select five students at random. What is the likelihood that at least two of them buy a ring? Okay, well, let's start with the likelihood that two will buy a ring, which means I'm going to raise this percentage to the second, and if I'm going to select five students, I'm going to raise this percentage to the what? To the third. And remember, uh, we dealt with this not too long ago. We need a combination factor. This is just one of the terms of the expansion. So, uh, Baylor, I'm going to get you to help me out. Uh, there's a number that will go here, and then another one that will go here. Uh, Kendall. Okay, Je uh, Jessica. Yes, five total number of students. And then this should always be the... I always call this the exponent for failure or the alternative to what the problem has said. They should always match. 
Okay, you've actually got two different ways of going about this problem, and we'll look at this way, and we'll talk about the other one. Okay, well, that takes care of at least two. Well, what about three? If it's at least two, then we need to calculate two, three, four, and five. Okay, well, what's the likelihood, Madeline, that three will buy? Okay, and my combination factor will be, okay, and we'll come back and do that later. Well, we've calculated two, we've calculated three. Uh, let's see, Casey, how would I find out the likelihood that four will buy? To the what? They should add up to five, so, okay. And then what's my combination factor? Yeah, there you go. Okay, and we'll come back to that. Well, we've found two, we found three, we found four. Uh, Brooke, what about, what's the likelihood that all five will buy? to the fifth, okay, which means uh, 0 0.70 will be raised to the zero, and then what's my combination factor? Okay, now, at this point, you're going to use your calculator, you're going to come up with these four decimals, you're going to add them up, and that's your answer. Now, this is one approach that we could take, but I'm wondering if you see another way of approaching this problem, getting the answer. Does anybody see approaching this from a different way? We've looked at the likelihood that 2 will buy, 3 will buy, 4 will buy, 5 will buy, and we're going to add those up to get our answer. But can we come at it from a different perspective? Yes. And then do what? Exactly. Which do you think would be easier? Yeah, what if we found the likelihood that nobody will buy and then one will buy, find those two, add them together, and then subtract. Instead of finding the likelihood that all these will buy and add, we could have gone the other way, and um, it just depends on the problem, which is a better way to approach it. Since we already have this, uh, let's just go ahead and add these up. So I'm going to give you a minute to grab your calculator, and uh, you can do all of this at once, 5C3 times 0.3 to the second, times 0.7 to the third. And uh, I'm going to get somebody to give me that decimal. And we'll go ahead and let's round, let's go three decimal places. Three decimal places. So Gentry, do you have that first one? Anybody have the first one? 5 NCR 3 times 0 0.3 to the second times 0 0.7 to the third. What do you got? 10? Even? Okay. Give me another. I know what the final answer is, but I don't have it broken up. So, Connor, what do you got? 0 0.309. Okay. Sounds good. Now let's do the same thing. Uh, maybe you can just leave that in your calculator and go up and replace just these numbers without having to retype everything. Just You do need to make sure that you're able to come up with these. That is important. So if you're having trouble, uh, let me know, and I'll pause and come and we'll check it out. Having trouble? Okay. Uh, let me see... Uh, Grace Ball, do you have the second one? Jessica, do you have the second one? 0.132. Okay, make sure you're able to match up with those. 
Uh, just raise your hand if you have this third one, 5C1, Brooke. 0 0.028. And uh, if you have this last one, anybody have that? Got it? Okay. Now we just need to add. Let's add these up. And uh, hopefully rounded. Uh, we might be off just a little bit because of rounding, but this should add up to 0 0.472. Check check that out and see what you got. That's close enough. We're gonna round. Uh, we're we're gonna say about 47 percent. Okay, and then once again, I'll just mention this. We're not gonna work all the way through it, but you could have found the likelihood of nobody buying, one person buying, okay, here's nobody, nobody buys, one person buys, Find those two, add them up, and subtract from 100, and you would have gotten the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So when you subtract, you're, you're pretty close to, to that. So in this case, it does make more sense. I just wanted to give you a little bit of review of how to come up with each of these because it's been a while. Okay. Sometimes it really doesn't make any difference. You're right in the middle of the expansion. So any questions on 21? Fear to see this again. This is a probability using the binomial theorem. All right. All right. I like these log problems. Uh, you are not using a calculator for this. So let's work through solving for x. Okay. Well, to begin with, Let's go on the left side and use what we know about the properties of logs to put these two together. Um, let me see. Grace powers two logs that have the same base that are being subtracted. You can put those together using what? It's called the quotient property. That's a clue. You do. Okay. And... So it's like this, log base 2 of 24 divided by 3, and what is 24 divided by 3? Okay, so I'm going to write it as just 8. All right, um, over on the right side, we have uh, log base 4 of x. Okay, now... What is log base 2 of 8? Uh, Abby, it means 2 to some power equals 8. So what's the power? Okay, so log base 2 of 8 is literally 3. All right, so far so good. Now, to get x, let's rewrite this as not a log equation, but an exponential equation. Some number raised to a power equals something. Uh, help us out with that. Oh, Kendall, what would this be as an exponential equation? What's the base of the log? Okay, so that's going to also be the base for some number. All right, so now we've got to come up with the exponent for, for, for 4, and what do we know about logarithms? What are they? Yeah, so this is literally screaming the exponent is 3. Since logs are exponents, if you're looking at a log equation, it's pointing to what the exponent is. And so what's our final answer? 
4 times 4 times 4. 64. So on this test, I'm going to see, do you remember the properties? Now, don't think because this is subtraction, it will be that way on your test. You need to know all the log properties. You need to know how to evaluate logarithms. How did we come up with three here? And then uh, how to change from log form to exponential form. This is a really good log review problem. All right. Chapter 9 review problem. How am I going to solve for x here? Gent I'm going to get Gentry to help us out with this. Okay, clear out all the denominators by doing what? Okay, the lowest common denominator, and uh, what would that be for 2, 6, and x? Six x. All right. So let's multiply by six x on both sides. So Gentry, I'll just stay with you. Um, what will we get for this first fraction after multiplying by six x? Three x. Good. And then move over to the next fraction. What would you get there? X squared. Very good. And then what about on the right side of the equation? All right. So what kind of an equation is this, um, Trent? We would call this what kind of equation since it's squared? Hint, hint. Starts with a Q. It is a quadratic equation, and we know all about those. We are quadratic equation professionals. We know they have to equal zero. We know that we've got some options on how to solve them, either factoring or quadratic formula. Uh, does this factor? Are there factors of negative 108 that add up to three? What do you think, Jessica? 12 and nine, one of them will have to be negative. Okay, positive 12, negative 9. So our two answers, since neither one of these make 0 in the denominator, we have two answers, negative 12 and positive 9. So, a little chapter 9 review. Clear denominators by using the LCD. All right, almost done. This goes back to our conic section chapter, last test. Write the equation for a parabola that is centered at the origin. Let's do a little rough sketch. Here's the vertex here at the origin. And we're told that the directrix is x equals 5. All right, let's just do a line vertical x equals 5. So what does that tell me about how this parabola opens? Uh, Baylor, how does this parabola opens if this is the vertex and this is the directrix? To the left. Very good. All right. So tell me, does anybody remember the equation just in general for the parabola that opens to the left? Is it x equals or y equals? Well, which axis is it opening on? So it's going to be x equals. Um, should a be positive or negative? Negative. It opens to the left, and left is negative. So now we just have to find the actual number that we're going to put in for a. Can you remember last test? We have a little formula that helps us find this number a. What is that formula? Anybody remember? Absolute value of A, very good, equals 1 over 4C. Okay, well, what is C? What does C stand for? It's distance from vertex to, we don't have a radius, that's for a circle. We typically say it's distance from vertex to focus. 
but I don't have a focus. I have a directrix, but isn't it the same? Aren't they the same distance away? So what is C in this case? Five, okay. So what's A going to be? One twentieth. All right, I'm ready to finalize my answer. I'm just going to come over here and erase the A. Don't erase the negative because it opens to the left. And my answer is x equals negative 1 20th y squared. Now, that's a little different because I used to give you the focus. Well, now I'm giving you the directrix, just a little different way of presenting the information. One more. You can do this. Write the equation for an ellipse, standard form, centered at the origin. Here's the focus. Here's a, a covertex. Well, right away, what I typically do is I label. If I'm given the focus, then I know what C is. C is 5. C stands for the distance from the center to a focal point. If I'm given a covertex, I'm labeling B. B is the distance from the center to a covertex. In this case, it's 12. What do I not know? I don't know A, and A stands for not covertices, but vertices, okay? Uh, tell me, let's see, who can I get to answer this question? I'm going to get Nick. Can you tell me which axis is major? Is it the X axis or is it the Y axis? How come? You're right. He said the X axis. How did you know that? Nick is right uh, because the focus foci are on the x-axis. Foci are always on the major axis. So uh, let's go ahead and set up our equation. Ellipses always look like this. The question is, where is a squared going to go and where is b squared going to go? We don't even know what a squared is. But this will help us find it. C squared, if C is 5, then C squared is 25. Don't know what A is yet. Uh, if B is 12, B squared is 144. So A squared is 169. All right, so where am I going to put 169 to show that X is the major axis? Will I put it underneath X or will I put it underneath Y? I put it underneath x. If x is the major, it gets the bigger denominator, which will always be a squared. And that means process of elimination. I need to put 144 underneath y squared to show that it's the minor axis. And that is this entire review sheet. I hope this helps. Uh, if you need more help, come and see me either during academic support or after school.